Is it working? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Adams. Uh, thank you very much for giving me your attention for the next uh, 25 minutes. Um, if you've ever been to DjangoCon before, you may remember me from uh, DjangoCon Europe in Florence in 2017 when I spoke about Django and climate change. And if this interests you, I'm running a workshop tomorrow to apply the ideas in that talk to your own project called Green Your Django Project. Um, you all, if you've heard the name Chris Adams before in the Django world, uh, there is a, I, this, this happened last night. Like, oh, you're Chris Adams. I use all your stuff. Um, sadly, that was that guy, not this guy, right? I am the less famous, uh, less well known instance of Chris Adams in the Django community. And I now believe I am doomed to live in this man's shadow. One day we might meet, and I suspect if we touch, we we'll end up annihilating each other in some kind of weird antimatter explosion. But I digress. Today, I'm here to talk to you about Jupiter, Outer, and Django. And uh, I think I'm talking to you because they're three interesting projects. And uh, for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to split this talk into three main parts, where I'll talk to you about notebooks, share some useful theory about visualization, and then show you how to apply this in a Django project. So are you sitting comfortably? Yeah, then I'll begin. OK, so let's talk about notebooks first. First of all, though, I feel compelled to congratulate you all on your life choices on choosing to learn Django. Um, you have chosen to learn what is very likely the most popular web framework for the most popular dynamic language in the world with the largest, healthiest community ecosystem. Go you. Um, and uh, this is about as close as winning a lottery gets when you're thinking about being a developer. Because uh, if you can think of a problem, the chances are that someone's actually working on it and they're doing so with a stable, non-shifting uh, ecosystem and a well-maintained standard library. Uh, but things are changing, though. And uh, Daniel, uh, da Daniele Procida said something to me earlier on this year, which kind of caught my eye. He, he mentioned this, this survey from uh, the, the, PyCharm, uh, the, the, the PyCharm survey from 2018, where they basically surveyed more than 20,000 developers and uh, from 150 different countries to see how they're using Python. And uh, this last year, 2018, was the first year that people are using it for data analysis more than the web. And I think it's fair to expect more of this. Um, and as people who work with data analysis first come to the web, and as we, as developers, uh, increasingly need to think more about data analysis ourselves, I think it's worth looking at some of the tooling that they use, because it might be useful for us. And if you've worked with Python for data analysis, the chances are very high that you will have come across Jupyter, uh, or at least heard of it, because it's basically the tool that everyone uses. Now, let's look at these in more detail. So when we look at a notebook, we see a few interesting things. We can see some mixed media. There's like some markdown and some mathematical formula here. We can also see some code snippets. So there's input here, and then there's some kind of output. And there's all these kind of slidey widgets, which, make, which suggest that they're interactive. But when I look at this, and this is the screenshot from their own homepage, it's not obvious to me what they're for yet. Uh, so the term that Jupyter, uh, the Jupyter Project team use, they use narratives. So like, these are good for making narratives. So, so what's a narrative, right? I mean, let's unpack that. Uh, the main thing about a narrative that you think about is that there are kind of four things uh, that make it a narrative. So narratives are collaborative in that you might write one with the expectation that others will run the same code as you or maybe tweak it and follow along with it. They're shareable and then they exist primarily in a browser so that if you want to share it with someone, you just share a URL. And uh, they're publishable in that the notebook itself shows your commands and also shows the output, like the return values from a function. But it also, uh, and it shows them together, and it also serializes them into a kind of notebook format that you can actually publish on, say, an S3 bucket, or online, and so on. And they're reproducible in that once you've seen the results, it's possible to kind of run the entire notebook all the way through to kind of see if you can get the results yourself, which is why they're so popular in academic context, because they help solve some of the kind of reproducibility crisis that, people, that, we, that, that we're struggling with. So this might feel a bit academic. So like, what are, we, what are we using them for in the real world? So I'm not sure if I can get over to this. Let's see. Where is it? Ah, there it is, yeah. So The Economist uses these. They have all these kind of cool vis visualizations. And uh, I'm not going to try and explain purchase power parity in, five, in, in a minute per slide for my budget. But basically, they do all these cool vis. And like, what you're seeing now is basically, as an English person, what's happened to our currency and how, seeing how we got poorer over the last few years. Right? And, uh, you would think, okay, that's interesting. Uh, but what they also do now is they share all the source code for things like this. So they basically say, this is what's happening, and here's the actual source code so you can actually trust what we're talking about. So this is quite common in data journalism now. 
what you also see is O'Reilly. Now, who's O'Reilly? Has anyone used like uh, sign up for like the Riley Safari thing or anything like that? Show of hands. Okay, if you if you're with the ACM, it's like 100 euros, 100 euros for the year. It's totally worth doing. But what they do, they've got some really cool stuff. So they have a they they use they're building on top of notebooks to build things like this. So this is Peter Norvig, who is a well-known Pythonista, and he's talking about how he codes. And then he'll write like an example of him solving a problem. And then you can jump in at any point to the code and try running the code yourself. And like, if you had sound, you'd hear it saying, but there honestly isn't that much that is really useful here. But because you can see what he's doing, you can then kind of play around with this. And then you can basically run arbitrary Python on some servers somewhere, which aren't yours, uh, which I used for some cheap gag like this. But you can basically see that, OK, yep, that's being run. So if I wasn't actually just doing something here, I could actually see what's happening here. And it'll come up, and then boom, things come back. So you can actually like, interact and like, experiment with stuff as you, as you work through this. If you work in DevOps or anything like that, Datadog incorporate this into their platform now. So whenever there's an outage or if there's a runbook, you can actually say intersperse readmes and write-ups with what queries you're doing and what's coming out of this to see what, the, so you can like see what, so other people can see what you saw at the time and why you made a decision or why you might make another decision in future. And uh, Netflix are really, really, really big on, on notebooks. So they've built all this tooling around it to the point that like, there is a kind of thing called Interact now, which is a really easy to install kind of Electron wrapper around Jupyter Notebooks. They use it for kind of ad hoc analysis, and they connect it to like, all their big data pipelines. But they do some other interesting things. They run them on cron jobs. So instead of having cron jobs, they'll run a notebook to do a load of work, and then it'll basically show all the results of what they're doing like, in context. And uh, they store everything in a massive like S3 bucket here. And now you can use all these things because pretty much every single thing that you see here is, is open source. And that's really, really useful. But uh, they run something like 150,000 of these notebooks every day to do different kinds of analysis. And uh, thankfully, we can use some of that code. Um, it might be worth thinking, like, how is, how is any of this possible? Um, there's a clue in the name. So Jupyter is a polyglot project. And it came out of uh, these that used to be called an IPython notebook. Um, Basically, Ju stands for Julia, like the high-performance uh, programming language. Python, I don't need to explain that to this group here. And uh, Jupyter is for RStat, which is the kind of previous very, very well-known tool for doing any kind of statistical analysis. And uh, the reason this is possible is because we've got this kind of diagram here. That might be us using a browser here. There's kind of a notebook in the middle. And uh, that doesn't do that much work itself. But it just, for, it just passes on work to a kernel that, work, that, that, that kind of executes the Python or R or Julia or whatever you want. And then it keeps a note of what gets returned when you run a function. And then it writes that into a notebook file that, you, that can be shared. And this means that the kernel can be written, can be anywhere in the world and can be written in any language. So you can be like a huge compute cluster on, say, Google's cloud, or it can be a running Django shell process so you can interrogate your own, your, your, your own uh, Python application or your own Django application. And uh, this means you can access something through, through a browser rather than just using a terminal. And that's the other thing. So when we have a terminal, we have all these things available to us that you don't necessarily have in, a, that in, in just text. Because like text can, text is useful, uh, but it's useful. To, but it does have limits when you're trying to convey meaning or kind of compress information into a particular space. So here's an example. Uh, you can do this, but please don't. Right? If you were to kind of write a class, you can basically change like the Tistra model uh, uh, method to kind of return to things back. And because of working with Python 3, we can do stuff like this now. Now I'm saying you can do this, not that you should do this, because there's all, reason, all kinds of reasons why you wouldn't. And if you did do this, then like, well, this, cause this is actually a fairly dense way of communicating information about this, pro about this thing that you could actually take into account based on the model and so on. So you could have a scenario where maybe you're working in the shell. And uh, you might say, OK, I do this. And then the, the output might be something like this. All right? Or if you try to do something like, a, say, um, a list comprehension, let's see. What do you recommend to get back? Something like this. Now, don't do this, all right? It's only as a, I'm only showing this with you as an idea of, to kind of get this idea of having multiple ways to represent an existing data structure. And some ways can be more informationally dense than just having plain text, all right? And uh, this is the kind of thing which is why I, why I want to talk to you about the notebook parts. Because if you've got a whole browser, you can do things that you couldn't do before. And I'm going to try and bring, find my pointer again to move it over here. Yeah. 
So if you've got data which lends itself to being, say, is that all going to work? Yeah. If you've got data that lends itself to being kind of tabular, rather than showing like an approximation of a table, we can show a real table, right? Or if we've got, say, a bunch of dicks like this, dic dictionary, that is, then, <laughs> yeah, you can actually then try representing that in a kind of more kind of webby fashion. So you can explore stuff and see what it looks like. So like, there's all these things that you can do when you've got a browser rather than just uh, a, a terminal. And uh, depending on like, what the data is, there are other things that, kind of, that allow you to kind of, I guess, represent something in a way that's more true to the underlying data. So this is, like a ge this is what you might do with GeoJSON in a in, uh, with, with notebooks, right? Because you know it's spatial, you can show it on a map. And this animated GIF is basically showing uh, JSON on Earth, but also JSON on Mars. We're using some kind of map tiles. But the idea is that you're, there are, there are, there's more than one way to represent uh, a data structure. And I think this is actually a really useful idea to hold on to. Um, the other thing is, uh, when you start working with Viz and think, oh, wow, there's all these things I can do, it's very easy to get the, the Viz wrong. And like, for example, when I think about pie charts, I assume they add up to 100%. And when I look at this, I'm not sure that it does. Right? So this makes it harder for me to understand it. And it's, as Pythonistas, if our main job is like writing code, it'd be nice if we could do something like, I don't know, pip install Viz knowledge. right? And at this point here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some theory, because I've been having to explore some of this with our work recently. Um, if, I, if you had to just buy one book for the next 10 years to help you understand visualization better, I suggest it's this one here by Dr. Tamara Munzner. Um, her book was life-changing for me. And uh, it's common to think, like, you read a book and think, oh, that's cool, and that's cool. Um, this was the main thought I had when I was reading this talk, uh, when, when I was reading this book. And I've linked to a video, which is an hour long, which basically presents all of her ideas, or all of the ideas in the book, in a really, really nice format. And I, I, seriously, it's, it's, it really, really changes how you think about visualization and presenting things. And the key, thing that, the key takeaway from that talk, which I'm going to kind of run over quickly, is that we have way that data, in the world of data viz, we've got a lots, of the, lots of similar ideas that map really ni nicely to our concepts. So we've got things like, say, in data viz, you've got like data types, which are a bit like our data structures. And then they might come in different shapes. So you might have tabular ones, you might have links and graphs or trees. Like this stuff shouldn't be that. This should feel relatively comfortable to you if you're used to working with data. And then each of these data types have uh, items inside them have attributes, just like we do. All right? And these attributes can come in different flavors. So we've got categorical things, and then we've got which are like uh, different t kinds of things. And then there's like ordered, right? maybe ordinal, which is not necessarily a kind of discrete scale, but is more, uh, it, I mean, it is discrete, not continuous. And like quantitative, you see like there's different things like this. And uh, once you've got some items uh, in, in a data structure with attributes, you might represent them um, as a mark on a page or on a screen. And these marks might come in different flavors. So you might have like points and lines and areas. But, and then you will encode information about each of these marks to convey meaning using some of these channels. So you have different, cha different channels available to you. So you might have things like position being one, or you might have color being another, or shape. And uh, you can use these in combination to basically can you convey a greater amount of information in a small, in, in, in a limited space. And just to make this feel a bit more kind of co uh, comfortable, I figured I'd share some examples of this. So on the left-hand side, we have a mark, which is a bar chart. So we've got a bar mark. And we're encoding information in two parts. We're using the exposition for this part here and the length. But uh, likewise, we can, do, we can change the mark and convey the same information as dots. But if we wanted to encode more variables in this, we might choose to have color to show something else about this. Likewise, if we wanted to encode size, then we can, once again, in the same space, encode more amounts of information in uh, the same amount of space. And uh, at this point here, you might think, well, OK, this is cool. But I don't know, what if I, how do I, make, how do I know that I'm doing this right? How do I know that I'm actually using the correct kind of channels to encode the correct kind of information? The nice thing is, is that People have been thinking about this for a really long time, and they've actually been testing this kind of stuff uh, with various tools. And like, there are helpful tables like this, which you can kind of check. And this helps us understand why bar charts are often so popular and so effective. Because they're basically positioning things on a common scale, 
usually uh, uh, from in a series of on, on like from left to right, and we might use different colors to explain why they're different. And like this is actually quite useful because this gives us a kind of cookbook or set of things that we can refer back to if we're trying to find a way to communicate a dense amount of information to people who are often either not uh, either distracted or they're working on a, a, a number of other things or they just don't have that much time. So we might think, okay, how do we use this? This is nice, but I'm just sharing like academic theory with you. So the nice thing is, is that all this kind of really, all, all, all this thought, like really solid foundational stuff, is encoded into a library called Vega Light. And uh, all these diagrams here basically use that vocabulary that I just shared with you now. So you've got some really, really cool WYSI analysis and everything like that, but there's basically a kind of JSON data structure to describe these that you can actually, well, basically display. And I'll just show you some examples of this so you can see what it looks like. So we've got a simple bar chart here which is showing rain in Seattle. We've got a data set coming in. And then we're choosing to kind of represent that using a bar mark that we had before. And then we're encoding in X along, along here. We're encoding kind of the time. And then for the amount of rain, we're using that precipitation, which is inside this. And we're, showing that we're saying it's quantitative. And that's how we can basically end up with a fairly simple diagram like this. Like, this is cool, but we can do more. So we can have, say, two marks on the same chart to show us things like, say, the mean amount of uh, precipitation or well, basically some stuff here, right? You can add more information into the same space. And like, this is cool, but I'm now making you have to need to like, think about, J about JSON and JavaScript, and like, I'm at a Django conference where we're more comfortable using Python. Thankfully, this is actually uh, basically done in Python. This, it would be really nice if we could have something like this, right? We want to import a URL to show something, and then we could just use our, our, our Python library to say, well, I'd like that, and I'd like that. And uh, this is basically what Altair is. Some people have taken the ideas of Vega and Vega Lite with all the solid theoretical underpinnings, and they've basically written a nice Python wrapper around this stuff. So all the cool WYSI charts that I'm not showing you elsewhere, but on this page, you can make using Python now. And uh, I'll explain what it's doing under the hood, because that might help give you some kind of understanding here. All right? It's called Altair. And what Altair is doing is basically working with, uh, we, we're using a DSL here, which spits out some Vega light here. Vega light then creates another, another kind of more kind of dense version called Vega. And then we start working with D3. Who's anyone, has anyone worked with D3 here? OK. How many of you enjoyed it? Yeah. <laughs> right? And then that can, can combine down to SVG. Or for performance, you might want to have Canvas. So this basically lets us play around and express information that we actually have available to us in a very, very dense form without having to understand this entire stack. But if we do need to get help working with the stack, we're using common, well-known, popular tooling, so it's possible to actually get help with, it, with this. And uh, I just want to say, like, thank you, Jake. I don't think I'm ever going to meet this man, but he's been working on this more than anyone else. And uh, I think that people, if you're working in open source, it's really, really useful to actually kind of acknowledge this stuff, kind of like the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi's been awesome today, right? Anyway. So now we're talking about applying this. What, what can we do with this? So do you remember how I was talking to you about this diagram here, where we've got a browser here, and then a notebook server, and a kernel doing some work? Well, if we were to implement this in our Django applications, it would look a bit like this. So we've got a smiley face here speaking to a browser. And then we'd be using Altair to generate some kind of JSON that we'd render in the browser. And then we might have some ORM or something, maybe SQL Alchemy now that we've discovered. It does all these, all these cool things. And uh, it might look a bit like this. So we've got like some basic uh, model here. We might say, do a, do a call like this, and we'll convert things into get our values back rather than the, the objects, because it's easy to work with. And then we'll basically say, well, please take all the, the, this, this list of objects and put it into a, query, in, into a list of, of kind of dictionaries that we can work with. Then we'd pass that in, and then we'd encode using the marks that we wanted. And then we just return it as a JSON response. And then in the, in, in the actual page that we'd be showing, We'd have, well, we'd have our a, 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 a URLs to kind of hook this up so, so the next page makes sense. But we'd end up with something a bit like this. So we fetch Vega, Vega Lite, these bits here. And then we might have a div called viz that we will we'll replace with it. And then we just fetch our thing. And then we say, please, t please do the to string or to viz method on the JSON that we get back. And then that's basically it. That's how we can basically work in Python, use tools we're comfortable with to explain ideas and, and explain things visually with people, and actually make it available to people on the web. And I'm going to try for a quick and dirty example now, because I did use the word quick and dirty in the talk title. 
All right? Has anyone heard of Drawdown here at all? OK, cool. We've had th two or three people have put their hand up. This is really, really cool because, OK, climate change is a thing, and we should probably be thinking about it more as professionals. And uh, these, uh, Drawdown is basically a project where people have looked at the 100 most substantive solutions that you could apply. Now, there's all kinds of questions about like, the assumptions made in this neoliberal kind of framing of this, but there is a lot of interesting stuff inside this, and they do have a, t a kind of ranking of all the charts, of, of all the things that might, all, all the kind of interventions that we could actually do to, well, I don't know, stay in an inhabitable world, right? And uh, I'm going to show you what some of this looks like with those card code examples to kind of prove that it really does work. And uh, for, before I do that, though, I'm going to show a screenshot, so in, just in case the, demos, the, 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 the demo gods didn't smile upon me. So let's see if we can go with this. I'm going to try and grab it now. OK. Can you see something turning up? Yes, you can. Cool. Right. So what you're looking at here is basically the code that I showed you a minute ago, right? And if I can zoom, am I able to like, increase the size of this? Oh, God, what have I done there? Let's close that. Can I? Yeah, there we are now. Yeah. So this shows us all the things that we might want to do, right? And we might think of things like, OK, like electric cars are going to be saving us or anything like that. But when you look at this, you can see that electric cars aren't actually that much of, a, of an intervention, right? The biggest, single biggest thing that looks like it's going to actually buy us time is actually fixing how fridges are disposed of because they release these CFC, these, the, these gases, which are really, really, really bad news for the, uh, when they're in the atmosphere. But you also see some, see some other things, like some really big things here. Food waste, which what we were speaking about yesterday, that's a massive lever. So is actually diet, which, is, which came up a, t a few years ago. But you can see down here, like two, two of the biggest things, actually, if you combine them, they're probably the biggest thing. Like treating women with dignity really, really helps, it turns out, because it changes how families work. And uh, there's, there's, there's things like, say, if you have access to family planning and give people access to, to choice, and then the, the way that families grow ends up being different as well. But there's loads of interesting stuff which we wouldn't have seen if we just looked at, like, say, a single kind of CSV file. And uh, you can explore this stuff yourself. And there's loads of other ways of presenting this. And it looks different, mainly because I wasn't sure if you could actually see it on this, on this, on, on this uh, screen. So I'm just going to try and close this now and use the last of my time to say, is that right? Yeah, that worked. Is that if you do care about this stuff, um, I'm working with a company who basically paid for us to work on and uh, on, on find out this kind of stuff. They're called Spend Network. They're hiring. And they're looking to use these ideas or basically take the last 10 years of open data to find out how public uh, money is being spent and basically see where the, inter where, where the biggest levers are in terms of climate change so you can do something there too. They're hiring, so please do speak to me afterwards. But I said I'd talk to you a bit about notebooks, give you some theory, and show you how you might apply this theory in your work so that you can actually present things in a kind of a visually arresting and interesting and, if, and dense way using these tools, Jupyter, Altair, and Django. And I think I did that. So I'm going to say thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, I have this opinion, this weird opinion, that if we're professionals, then we should think about the harm that what we do, we think about the harm caused by how we work, and we should try to minimise it. And I think that if you're not doing that, I would argue that you're not really being all that professional. And uh, I'm running this uh, workshop tomorrow to kind of explore that with other people, because, yeah, the biggest lever we have is the fact that pretty much everything we build runs on fossil fuels right now, and, like, this is such an easy thing for us to fix. So, yeah, if that interests you and, like, the you know, continued existence of humans interests you, please speak to me or come to the workshop tomorrow. And uh, this deck is online, and the code that I showed you, the Django app, that's also online, so feel free to fork it, and you can see how you can actually use, say, IPython to speak to a Jupyter notebook and have some fun with it. Okay, that's it. Uh, I think I've got time for questions, yeah. I don't know. Do I have yeah. time? Yes. We have about four minutes for questions. Uh, so we can do DjangoCon, hashtag DjangoCon QA online, or you can line up for questions. Oh, there's always a question. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very, very informative. Um, it's great to have a library that provides you with the means of doing very different kinds of data analyzation and visualization, but do you have any resources on how to choose the correct type of visualization to provide, because that's pretty tricky? Yes, there is actually a really good resource from the Financial Times, 
Uh, they do actually list this. I am see if I can find it, right? So financial, the Financial Times have this basically list, and it's also using uh, the Vega and Altair tools, right? Yeah. So basically, this thing was pr pr produced by, I think, Financial Times saying, this is how you should use our charts. And they use it internally, and they shared it because it makes them look cool. And then someone's taken that idea, thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe I can implement that in Vega, which means we get all of that. So how cool is that? That's my answer. I'll share the link for it. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, you've shown a picture of the Netflix architecture. Yes. And you don't have to scroll back. Um, even though most of those things, as you said, are open source, they are probably on a different scale. So I'm wondering, um, how can you use the code in um, Jupyter Notebooks without like running a kernel? Because like I reuse it in Python without not the overhead of the kernel, but like ah. I don't I don't have want the kernel running on the servers and so on. OK, so the, the approach I take, and uh, the thing I've been using, uh, let's see if I can share this. Because uh, is this going to work? I'll check it. Nope, it's now, it's now we've got, we know we're at this conference. So I was going to show you uh, an example of some code in Jupyter that I'd be using in a kind of scratch session like I would be using in, in IPython. Then I take those bits and put it into a class and then call methods that way. That's the kind of like working in the repo approach that I guess the Clojure community are known for and a few other ones are. So you don't actually need to be running all this stuff. You can just actually work out the bits of Python that you care about and then call those on like, I don't know, you could probably call it on a serverless function if you, if you, if you really wanted. But now we know there's more to it than that. So, yeah, that would be my answer. But I'm happy to talk in, in more detail afterwards. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, what is the best way to make the notebooks available to other people? Because you said it's just a URL, but like uh, to make it not publicly available on the internet? Ah, or? there are a few ways. So, if you use VS Code, uh, or if you use kind of most IDEs now, they've realized that notebooks are really, really handy. And uh, because most, lots of the kind of cool new editors have, are basically running on Chrome, you can basically use that stuff internally. So you can actually export things as, as, as Python. But also, Google have a thing called Colaboratory, which is free to use, and it just gives you some magic uh, kernel somewhere that you can use. But there's also a tool called Binder, which lets you run these things internally as well, which basically spins up a load of Docker containers according to your requirements file. And then you can have that on your own hardware, or if you have, if, if there's no reason to hide what you, or no reason to not share it, you can use it on public infrastructure as well. There's also this massive European science cloud where they just like provide kernels for you to plug into. Uh, so, yeah, there's, a, there's, lo there's lots of options, and I'm, I'll, I can add some links to this talk afterwards, actually. Or file an issue, and I'll add some more links that way. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, we are all out of time, um, and we have a great speaker next. Um, but I'm sure we can find you uh, yes. around. Awesome, yay. Thank you, everyone.